Hey, you have my permission. It's okay. Go ahead. Do it. You can take another route. You don't have to go that way. You, you can take another path. You can always take a detour that'll still get you to where you want to go. So you have my permission to swap any and all ingredients that you want to. And I'm going to show you how to take a food detour today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Hey, welcome back everyone to the Carefree Cooks Code. It's a Tuesday, it's noon in the East, and that's when we always get together live. If you missed any of them, you should go to my past episodes archive on Facebook. Just click videos there or go through about 500 free videos on YouTube. And now you can follow what I'm cooking for dinner along with the steps and how I did it. The methods, not the recipes on Instagram. And oh, that's the result of our paella class the other day. You'll see, follow me on Instagram. You'll see it. And one more time, don't ever be left out of one of my live broadcasts. Too many people tell me that they're missing them. Set your notifications correctly. Right under the top, uh, uh, under the video on the top of my page is the follow button. Click the follow button. And then once you're following me, you can click the barely visible little pencil there next to notifications. Click standard and you will never miss another video again. Because why? Why do we do all this? It's because we're carefree cooks. We create our own recipes. We bring friends and family together. We learn every time we cook. We create our own cooking style because we practice pro methods and we love our cooking. That's what it's all about. But you know, that that one create my own cooking style. Think about that. I, I, I want to concentrate on that one today. Create your own cooking style. Let's let that sink in for a minute. All right. Next, I want you to listen very carefully to this statement. Are you ready? You're listening, right? What you choose to eat doesn't change how cooking works. It's the key. <laughs> it's the key to cooking any ingredient for any diet or any desire. And that's our topic today. But first I've got a, what am I? Uh, we, it looks like, Celery, onions, and carrots. There's a little French flag there for you. That's a lot of hints. That, that might be a really easy one for you. The what am I? Tell me in the comments section below. What am I? There's another hint. Eight letters and two words. Eh, might as well just give it away. Uh, look, you know, I got to ask you a question. If you're driving on the road, okay, imagine this. You're driving on the road and there's heavy traffic or a, a roadblock somehow. Do you, do you just like get out of your car and, and you walk away and you go, oh, well, <laughs> no possible way to get there. No, of course not. You find a way around it. You take a detour, right? But I find so many people are afraid to take these detours in their cooking. They, they got to drive straight forward, straight forward with it or not drive at all. But really it's the wrong way to think about this because again, what you choose to eat doesn't change how cooking works. And I spend a lot of time thinking about you, actually. I spent a lot of time thinking about how I can help as many people as possible. And I've been doing that for a dozen years or more because I want to be true to my personal journey, which is to figure out what I can do every single day to have the biggest impact on how you see food and cooking as a part of your life and lifestyle. And you know, I find 
that everyone is really paying attention right now, you know? It's my opportunity because controlling your own ingredients by cooking your own food at home has become really important to everyone everywhere. It transcends borders, religions, races. It's uh, unbelievable. And I have a personal creed. W would you like to hear it? Right? My personal creed, it, it comes from this idea in sales that you should have an elevator pitch. And since I have a sales background, before I changed my life entirely, discarded the whole thing, went to culinary school a few decades ago, I'm familiar with this idea of an elevator pitch. And it's the idea that if you got into an elevator with someone who turned and asked you, what do you do? you'd be able to answer within a few floors before the doors opened again. And I think everybody should have an elevator pitch. It, it, it kind of sets your intentions, you know? Write it down. Uh, look at it written. Say it out loud at least once a week. And, and you'll be amazed how you become more confident in who you are because you define it. I don't care. Say... I'm a mother, uh, or I'm a grandmother or grandfather who is uh, dedicated to helping others and, and making my children or grandchildren the, the best adults they can be. Uh, I work toward making my community better and safer and improving the lives of others with the knowledge that I have. Whatever you want to write like that, whatever truly comes out of your heart, you know, it's, it's that simple. Think about it. <laughs> Think about it. If you got into an elevator with someone who just turned to you all of a sudden and said, hey, who the heck are you? <laughs> you know, who are you? Who are you? Better said, uh, you know, look deeply, not as aggressive, but look into your heart. Hey, I'm genuinely curious. Who are you? You would have your elevator pitch to explain what your essence is, who you are. Now, mine, <laughs> mine have to, might have to take a really tall building in downtown Baltimore, many, many floors, because if you turned to me and, and said, hello, stranger, what do you do? I would be able to quickly say, I help amateur chefs who want to impress themselves and others by empowering them with how cooking works, using the dependable and repeatable methods not taught anywhere else so they can ignore recipes and cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride. And you know, I'll know I'm successful when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health. Bing! And the doors open and we step out. <laughs> it, it's kind of like the opening video of the show. You see it every week. It's, that's where I got these ideas from, from, from my personal mantra, from my elevator pitch. But let me remind you one more time that what you choose to eat does not change how cooking works. Okay. So when you think, <laughs> when I think I'm all about fulfilling my own mantra, I, I want to help amateur chefs, I want to help home cooks the best way I can, I want to have the biggest impact I can and immediately change people's cooking everywhere. So I came up with what I think is the most important thing for you to hear from me right now. And the most important thing that will apply to the most people today is that you have my permission to substitute any ingredients you want, any you do or don't want to eat, any you do or don't or have to eat or you can't eat or you just don't have, go ahead. Do it. It's okay. There is no such thing as a fail because this is what holds people back from discovering new things in cooking. The, the, this idea that there's one perfect way to make something. What's the recipe? What, what, what's the one way to do it? It's, it's the basis of why I have always believed that cooking has been taught all wrong for so long. There's not just one way to cook anything. Like there's no one way to drive somewhere. So, so you might get lost for a bit, you know, you, you, but you're eventually going to find your way. So if you see someone cooking chicken and you're a vegetarian, calm down and just use something else, you know? And if you see a vegetarian dish and you love it, 
uh, you love chicken, throw some chicken in there, right? This is, this is how we kumbaya. This is how we all come together. It's okay. We're all allowed to do these things because it's amazing to me when I get those, granted, a few people who comment on my videos and come to my classes and they say something like, you know, maybe I would take your classes if you didn't cook chicken. Well, it's the same, or, or they'll tell me that my recipe looks good, but they don't really like Brussels sprouts, so they're going to ignore it entirely. Use cauliflower, then, you know? People always ask me what to substitute for wine when cooking. Anything you want is the answer. Any liquid, except water. If it turns out bad, then you don't do it again, you know? What if you don't have lentils? Use beans or rice. What if you ask me, what's the best way to cook XXX? Oh my goodness, every day I get the what's the best way to cook question. If you want to know my opinion, the best way to cook anything is on the beach in Hawaii. But that might not be possible right now, you know? The best way to cook anything would be the way that is best for you, you gotta figure that out. And I'm always asked if I have any vegan, keto, diabetic, low carb, gluten free, low salt cooking classes, and you know what? Yeah, I do. <laughs> all of them, they all are that. Because what you choose to eat doesn't change how cooking works. I have a single curriculum of 48 lessons and a bunch of bonus videos that are vegan, that are keto, that are diabetic, low carb, gluten free, and low salt classes, provided that you use the ingredients that are appropriate for those diets because what you choose to eat doesn't change how cooking works. Now you should always consult with your doctor a dietitian, a nutritionist, someone that's helping you, right? Get your specific diet goals set for what you should be eating, but then come to me, <laughs> come to me and our huge community of thousands of people for how to cook it. Because what you choose to eat doesn't change how cooking works. I mean, you get it? You have my permission. <laughs> you can change any and all the ingredients in a meal that you saw somebody else make. Use the same method, but then pick the ingredients that you want. So let me give you a few detours here, food detours that you can take. And this is based on the questions and comments that I get all week long, which are, <laughs> which are quickly becoming a very long list every morning when I wake up. So uh, food detours, uh, easy, proteins for proteins. And I really can't think of an instance where you wouldn't be able to substitute a similar characteristic cut of beef for chicken, fish, or pork. And what I mean by similar characteristic is that it still has to match the method Method that you're planning to use. You can't, you can't substitute, uh, you know, take out a chicken breast and put in a five pound rib roast and put it in the saute pan. That's not what, it, you not sub anything for anything. You get the idea. That seems obvious, right? But your food detour could be a chicken breast for a thin steak, an eye round steak, or vice versa. Um, l let's concentrate on the method. If you're grilling you can't substitute the hamburger or the thick uh, chicken breast for like a, a flounder filet, a thin, lean white fish. Go with the heartier fish would be a good substitution for beef or burgers. Uh, swordfish, shark, salmon steaks, you know, cut from the round with the, with the spine bone in the middle, right? They're great on the grill. Take the same seasonings, make the same sauce as the dish you're copying, whatever you, it is you like about that dish that you saw somebody else make, change the protein, and then it becomes what you want it to be. It's an easy one, right? Swap proteins for proteins, real easy. But what about these vegetarian substitutions for animal proteins? And you might not think this is as easy, but if you look at it my way, maybe it is, because there's no reason you can't make a tofu stir fry instead of chicken. There's no difference in the dish. You make it yours. And then take it another step, change any chicken broth to vegetable broth. You know, then you own it, right? Uh, if you like things like falafel, chickpea cakes, uh, black bean cakes, tempeh is really good, uh, which is also a soy product uh, like tofu. Tempeh usually has grains or, you know, other kind of binders in it. It's good. It's chewy. It's crunchy. I mean, any of these items can be substituted on the grill. They can be substituted in a saute pan. Uh, they can be steamed. They can be roasted. 
They can be smoked. Have you ever had smoked tofu? It's awesome. I mean, it's really good. Do it any way that you would cook chicken, beef, or pork. Just change the method. And I'll tell you two of my favorite non-meat proteins are paneer and avocados. And I discovered paneer many years ago when I catered an Indian wedding in my catering hall. It's a lot of you might know the story. I've told it before. They insisted that I cater their wedding because they had been to a wedding I went to, but they wanted all this Indian food. It was nuts. The groom and the bride, they wanted the paneer. Uh, I, they taught me how to do it, and I've been making it ever since. That's decades ago. Uh, what paneer is is a really like firm cheese, kind of halfway between tofu and cream cheese, I get. But it's firm enough that you can cut it into cubes and you can cook it in just about any manner. What we did for this wedding was I made skewered paneer uh, skewers with green peppers and stuff and it takes the grill. I mean, it grill marks. This is a cheese that takes grill marks. It gets brown, it gets crispy on the outside, but still really soft in the middle. It's really, really good. Uh, I've dry rubbed the paneer with a whole bunch of spices and then sauteed it in oil in a, a saute pan. Get the same effect, crispy and really spicy and hot on the outside, really soft on the inside. Avocado. Look, if you're trying to avoid animal proteins, avocado has got to be one of the best vegetable source proteins you can get. And you can grill avocado. It takes it. You can steam avocado, saute it, broil it, roast it. It's endless. It's, you don't just mash it for guacamole. <laughs> avocado can be cooked. All right, so next, with those ideas, swapping protein for protein or protein for vegetable, let's go ahead and talk about the aromatics that you cook with. Because some people put onions and garlic in everything. They're called your Italian grandma. <laughs> now, but it, a lot of people can't eat onions and garlic. If you're on that like, FODMAP diet or for a lot of digestive issues, you don't want fermentable things like that. And if you can't cook with onions and garlic, just leave it out. Just, just don't even worry about it. You know why? I heard this phrase not too long ago. It goes something like, what you choose to eat does not change how cooking works. If you see a meal that you would like to recreate in your own kitchen, but it has onions in it, there is no need to send me an email and ask my permission or what you should do about the onions. Do you have to use the onions? No, you don't. Today, you have my permission to not cook with onions if you don't like them or if they don't like you, right? Um, I cook with a lot of bell peppers. Love bell peppers, but I hate the green ones. You know? Anytime somebody tells me to put the green ones in, I say I've got my own permission to change the, the green to red or yellow or any of the ones that I want. So let's talk about taking a really big food detour on this one. Let's, let's talk about taking the aromatics that you cook with and how you can change them, right? Because you use teams of aromatics and your basic mirepoix is carrot, onion, and celery. But look, I'm not a big fan of celery and it, it doesn't last very long in my fridge for as long as I want mirepoix floor and it, it doesn't freeze very well, so I leave it out. I just don't use it because I, I don't keep it in my kitchen. And if you don't like onions, leave it out or try shallots maybe. Try garlic, and, although shallots and garlic, that might be too much like mushrooms. Try um, parsnips, uh, uh, try turnips. Try mushrooms. There's a white mirepoix for you. That, that's something still white, but not an onion. You know, it's endless what you can do. For, forget about your basic mirepoix. You start to create your own signature mirepoix, right? So every time you want to use something that is cooked in your own style, right? You create your own cooking style. Every time you want to use a dish that, that, that has some kind of French version or, or has your version, you, you, you pull out that mirepoix. But what about using like leeks? <laughs> the green part of leeks or the white part of leeks or use other kinds of peppers, use tomatoes, um, use beets, scallions, uh, fennel root, lotus root. I mean, geez, there are so many other things that are grown in dirt but aren't a carrot, an onion, or a celery. Because when you start to explore this idea of international cooking, right? Adding flavors from other countries to your repertoire, you start doing things with the aromatics that you never would have done before. 
And I know <laughs> I've already given away the what am I for you uh, today. I kind of blew it. French uh, mirepoix is carrot, onion, celery. That was the what am I for today. If you guessed mirepoix or if you knew mirepoix, you don't have to guess. <laughs> you got it right. But in Italy, we put garlic, onion, carrot, celery, parsley, and fennel root together. Does anyone know what the aromatic mixture in Italy is called? Italian mirepoix? Anyone? It's called battuto. Cool, huh? So what if you started using battuto instead of mirepoix? All right, I'm going to give you an easier one. There's a Spanish flag in the corner down there. All right, that's a hint. Uh, we're going to be taking a food detour away from mirepoix. Uh, I don't think the Spanish and the French have ever gotten along very well. <laughs> We're not going to use batuto. The Italians are another thing. But this time, it's time for olive oil, tomato, pepper, onion, and garlic. No carrots in there at all. Seven letters. We're doing more what am I's since I blew the first one. Do you know what Spanish mirepoix is called? Anyone? This is, the, this is a thing that culinary students need to know. They need to know about a dozen of these things from different countries so that they can immediately pivot their cooking. So they immediately change the combination of aromatics and bring it to another country or, 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 make, or make it fit a specific diet. You know, this is the way chefs are taught. Well, the Spanish combination is called sofrito. And it's the same thing for Italian, for Mexican, a lot of Caribbean, Central American cuisines. I'll give you one more. Okay. Uh, a lot of my friends in the Southern U.S. are going to know this. If you're in, in the Southern U.S., if you're way down a bayou, uh, Louisiana way with some gators, <laughs> sorry, <clears throat> then you should know what onion, celery, and green pepper is called, right? Where are my etouffee fans? right? It's the Holy Trinity <laughs> down there in the Southern U.S. Nobody's Cajun grandma don't cook nothing without starting with that combination. There's German Suppengrün, Suppengrün, uh, which basically means soup greens, but Suppengrün in Germany is leek, carrot, and celery -ac. Swedes do parsley root, root, onions, and rutabaga. Uh, in Poland, they have Wyszleszka, yeah, uh, a lot of Z's, a lot of Y's, but in Poland, they use carrots, parsnips, celery, leek, and cabbage leaves. It would make sense. Polish use cabbage. A lot of things cooked with cabbage there. Look, we could go all over the world on this one. We could go from country to country, region to region, depending on what is grown there. They have a different combination of aromatics. You know why? Because they understand that what you choose to eat doesn't change how cooking works, no matter what language they're speaking. So the last detour we're going to take today is with flavor profiles, and it's the way that you season the dish. This is the most obvious way that you can change something that you don't like the flavor of, or maybe can't eat the spices. You know, a lot of people are, uh, don't like red pepper, cayenne pepper, or they're allergic to it, or some people just don't like spicy foods, you know? Use white pepper instead. The most undiscovered pepper for home cooks and home chefs is white pepper, in my opinion. I love white pepper. I learned about it in culinary school. It has such less of a zing to it, less in your nose, less on the back of your throat. It's great. Make that substitution. Uh, cilantro. Cilantro is a divisive little herb, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? People start fights over cilantro. People either love it or hate it. And if you hate cilantro, use parsley instead. What's the difference? So from there, you can start building your own spice teams. Start thinking about how you would take like an Italian dish and make it Spanish, a Spanish dish and make it Italian, right? Think about anything with oregano and basil is going to smell like Italian food to you. You can't avoid it. Take a dish that calls for the red pepper that you hate or you're allergic to, turn it into an Italian dish with the oregano and basil by using your spice team. And you should be arranging your cabinet into combinations of spices that remind you of a cooking or ethnic profile. You get it? If you like curry, use it on everything. If you hate curry, go to another country's seasoning and use that instead. It's okay. You're allowed. I'm giving you permission because... The truth of the matter is your cooking is never going to be a straight path. 
It's just not. It's never a road where there's no turns, right? It's not a journey where you never have to check a road sign. It, it is not a path that you never have to tap the brakes a bit. Your cooking may need a food detour when you encounter foods that you can't eat, you don't want to eat, or you just plain old don't have in your pantry. And that's what happens lately. Because that's when you think to yourself that Chef Todd drilled it into my head today because what I choose to eat doesn't change how my cooking works. And then you start to think about the dependable, repeatable, reliable cooking methods that you use all the time, but just change the protein. Change the aromatics. Use a new mirepoix. Change the seasonings and make it the way that you want it. That's the key to surviving in this kind of cooking. Learning how to make these food detours and knowing that there's never a fail. There's just a lesson. And I feel like the biggest impact that I can have on as many people as possible today is to give you that permission to change anything. Don't worry if your pantry doesn't have the item that somebody else is telling you to cook. Use what you do have. Use what you do want. Use what you should be eating and cook it the same way. So now, now is the time to experiment. Now is the time to take your confidence in how to cook and apply it to any ingredient for any diet or any desire and arrive somewhere brand new, another country. Arrive somewhere because now is the time that there are no failures, only lessons, only lessons learned for you now. Because what you choose to eat does not change how cooking works. Let's take a peek inside our Carefree Cooks community, now more than 11,000 members strong. They are all sharing ideas and inspirations with each other, taking food detours to make things the way that they want. They're ahead of me on this already. These are the lifetime members of web cooking classes. These are the cooks that I am most proud of because I get to be involved in their successes when they have those aha moments. So let's see what's cooking. Carol, <laughs> Carol felt like, uh, she said she felt like traveling in her kitchen, like she knew what I was going to talk about. So she made up a mock mole sauce. Spanish mole is awesome. She said she never made it before, but look, she figured it didn't look difficult and she used what she had and she's proud of it. May not be authentic mole. Fantastic for her though. That's all that matters. Uh, Dan wrote and said he had his worst Nightmare come true. Oh, his weekly farm box. <laughs> the delivery, it had eggplant and kale in it. Two things that he's avoided his whole life. <laughs> I loved it. But he said, look, no problem. I'm a carefree cook. I know dependable methods of cooking. I know the seasonings that I like. So what? I got a new ingredient. He took a food detour, wound up with this great meal. Nicely done. Uh, Kathleen says my mushroom risotto class last Wednesday was great, but she changed it all up. She didn't have to do what I do. I don't want you to do exactly what I do. She used beef stock in the risotto instead of, uh, uh, what did I use? Uh, shrimp broth. Uh, she cooked this pork instead of doing a fish the way that I do. Kathleen, you're allowed to do that, right? And everybody else is too. Nicely done. Uh, and lastly, it might not seem like a big deal to you, uh, but it is a big deal to me. And it's a big deal to Linda. And it's a major reason to celebrate because she made rice perfectly for the first time. This is such an important thing in your culinary journey, being able to make these basic greens and then flavor them. So I am so glad that I focused on rice all week long because the results are coming back to me in photos like this. Risotto and white rice and paella and it's coming, it's like a flood. So I'm really so proud of you, Linda, for figuring it out. So good. So cool. I'm so happy. Uh, look, it just comes down. It always comes down to having a dependable method, right? having dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that you can then plug into any ingredient that you want to because you might have heard this before, but what you choose to eat doesn't change how cooking works. And I've already revealed the what am I. The, the French mirepoix is onion, carrot, celery, right? 
what food detour are you going to make now? You're going to put three aromatics together, make your own mirepoix from now on? I bet you are. <laughs> it always seems to work out that way. And look, if you know someone who needs permission to go ahead and cook with the ingredients that they want for any diet or any desire, please like and share this video with them so they can learn how to take a food detour like we can. The bigger the detour, the more fun and the more exciting in my opinion. And if you want to go even further on this topic, if you want to delve even more deeply into this idea of taking your cooking to other places, check out my brand new class. It's called Food Vacation, Three Steps to Taking Your Kitchen Around the World. You can register for this brand new free class at webcookingclasses.com slash vacation. So until next Tuesday or perhaps sometime before, Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your cooking success. Bye everyone.